Sal, hello, salam. My name is Risto Kupsala. Welcome to listen to my speech about Pandunia. I gave this presentation two days ago to Pandunia Scientific Association in Shiraz University, Iran. I have changed the presentation a little bit. I have added some slides about the history of Pandunia and improved some details in the presentation. Let me tell you a few words about myself. I was born in Finland in 1979. Finland is in northern Europe and I live in northern Finland. Mm. I have been doing my career in software business. I graduated as a Master of Science in Computer Science in 2008. At the same time I have been a language hobbyist all of my adulthood. So I started making Pandunia in the year 2007 and in the recent years I have been studying linguistics and I'm about to graduate Master of Science in Finnish language and literature. So what is Pandunia? Pandunia is an international helping language or auxiliary language. Its job is to help people who speak different languages to talk together. It's an easy language that people can use when they don't have any other common language to talk with. So it is meant to supplement other languages in our multilingual world. It's not meant to replace any other language. However, Pandunia is not a world language yet. But rather it is a hobby for people who like languages. So as a language it is simple and fun to speak and learn. And there are already some speakers of Pandunia, so it is a living and growing language already. The name of the language Pandunia is combined from two international words, Pan and Dunia. The first part, Pan, is a Euro-American prefix, which means something that includes everything. It is known in words like Pan-American, Pan-European and Pan-Asian, or in other languages, for example Russian, pan amerikanski and pan europejski The second part, dunia, comes from the Afro-Asian word, probably originally Arabic word dunia, which means world. And it is known in very many languages, all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. So together, pan and dunia mean something that covers or represents all of the world. Now let's move to the history of Pandunia. It wasn't built in a day, you know. As I said earlier, I got really interested about languages in the year 2000, when I was 20 years old, so it was already 23 years ago. And back at that time, I learned about Esperanto. And Esperanto is an interesting language because it is also meant to help people to communicate in our multilingual world. And it is also a constructed language like Pandunia. However, I wasn't satisfied with the structure of Esperanto and especially I wasn't satisfied with its word stock because I thought that in the modern world, in the modern globalized world, Esperanto was too, too European. It didn't take into consideration the entire world. So I started making my own languages and it took several years before I invented Pandunia. So in 2007, I started the Pandunia language and at first it was my own personal language. Like it was a place where I could experiment with my ideas about language. So I did many kinds of things with Pandunia at first, and it didn't have a stable form or structure back then. Then in 2012, a few other people got interested about Pandunia for the first time. And I had to start taking this project more seriously. But there were some changes in my life, and, and starting from 2014, uh, and it lasted uh, several years, I had a pause in the development of language. I didn't really do much with Pandunia at that time.
But then again, in 2017, other people found Pandunia. And they were quite interested about it. Interested about the ideas behind Pandunia. So they made me continue developing the language. And I'm, I'm really glad that they did. But then uh, we were mostly communicating in Esperanto. And I think that affected the ideas about Pandunia. So I started developing Pandunia a little bit in a different direction. To the direction of Esperanto. So Pandunia had a grammar that marked word classes with vowel endings, just like Esperanto does. And in hindsight, it didn't work so well. You see, Esperanto grammar works best with European words, because European languages are something like Esperanto in their structure. But Pandunia takes words from all over the world. So the sim same structure doesn't work, or similar structure doesn't work so well with those those words. Consider, for example, East Asian uh, Chinese words that that don't have any endings at all. So it's really hard to force an ending to words like that. So I felt like the like the grammar of Pandunia version one went against the spirit of Pandunia. And therefore I decided to make change. And, and version 1 didn't become the final version of Pandunia, but we moved to version 2. And version 2 was more in the original tracks of Pandunia, the early Pandunia that is in the beginning of this diagram. But the version 2, which appeared in 2021, was a little bit rushed and it went too far to the opposite direction compared to version 1. So now we are trying to find a little bit of middle way and the version 3, which is the final version of Pandunia as far as I'm concerned, combines the best parts of version 1 and 2. There are three basic parts of language. Words, pronunciation and the grammatical structure. Even the global words have always been the basis of Pandunia. That has never changed. What has changed is the other levels over the vocabulary level. So in early Pandunia, the pronunciation was extremely simple. But later Pandunia has moved toward a direction that it is not extremely simple, but also not complicated. It is something in the middle. So the current version of Pandunia has enough sounds for international words. So that if there is a word that Pandunia has to take from some languages, then Pandunia has enough sounds to make that word sound close to what it is in the languages where it comes from. Also, one idea of Pandunia has always been that the grammar is minimal. It means that there are very few rules. And the question has always been a little bit between that. Is it, should the grammar be isolating? which means that it should uh, that the structure structurally every word should be unchanging and independent or should be, should there be some kind of grammatical marking that is coded into the words so in early pandunia and versions 1 and 2 pandunia's grammar has been isolating and in version 1 the word building is agglutinative, which means that more than one part can be glued into the same word. So let's start looking at Pandunia at the level of words. The big question here is that how to bring languages of the world together at the level of words. The fundamental question here is, who should own the world language? The stance that Esperanto and other international languages that have been made in the West is that the world language belongs to Western people only. And everybody else can join international communication if they learn a Western language. 
And in my opinion, this point of view is completely wrong. Everybody in the world is equally important. And everybody has the right to be represented in the world language. The world language belongs to everybody. It should be a picture of the world, just like the picture you see in the previous slide. There should be something from every continent, every culture, and every language even. But is it possible to represent every language in one language? There are more than 7000 languages in the world. That's too much, isn't it? Well, not really. You see, every language is connected to other languages. We are living in a modern world. Aeroplanes fly to every country. The internet is connecting us. We can make a phone call to anybody in the world in a matter of seconds. So every language is already in contact with other language. And every language has common words for new things like radio, telephone, computer or bus, or in another accent, radio, telephone, computer, autobus. And on the other hand, every language has common words that sound like the thing they describe. We know words from baby language like mama and papa, or maybe amma, appa, or ma, pa. All babies in the world use those two words to talk about mother or father or some other close close adult or maybe to talk about talk about what they need maybe the word mama means milk or breast then there are other words that imitate the sound like yam or nyam 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 ham or whatever and it means eating then there are some words for animals that imitate the sound of those animals like meow or mau the word for cat. Then there are words like hey, ha, huh? which means that you didn't hear something, so you're asking, what did you say, ha? Huh? Okay, and then if you want to get somebody's attention, you are probably shout something like hey, hoi, hi, something like that. And what is the sound of laughter? Ha ha, ha ha ha. So all of these words are already international in very basic way. And they are actually part of Pandunia. So mama, papa, yam, mau, he, hey, ha ha. They are just ordinary words in Pandunia. You can form sentences with these words. You can say mama yam, mama is eating, mau yam, the cat is eating, papa ha ha, father is laughing. Most international words are not as basic or as wise, widespread as mama and papa. Most international words are cultural, and they have started from some part in the world and then they have spread wider. In this world map, I have colored the ma major cultures of the world. In the blue color, there is the Euro-American culture, which has started off from the Medi Mediterranean Sea, and it has spread across the world widely from Europe to Siberia to Americas to Africa and to Oceania. Then there is the Afro-Asian culture in green which has spread from Middle East into North and East Africa into Southwest Asia, Central Asia, South Asia then there is the South Asian culture, which is in the <clears throat> subcontinent of India and has spread into Indochina. Finally, there is the East Asian culture, which has spread from China to neighboring countries like Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and the Malay Archipelago. The Euro-American culture covers geographically the areas of Europe, America, 
Oceania, so that includes Australia and New Zealand and other islands in the Pacific, and then also parts of Africa, especially in South Africa and West Africa, which are still speaking the old colonial languages like English, French and Portuguese. The classical languages of this culture are Greek and Latin. And for example, in English there are hundreds of Greek and Latin words. But that is also true of other Europe American languages like French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, German, Russian and so on. Some international words in this culture are idea, idea or concept, pause, break or pause or rest, telefono, telephone, turista, a tourist, football, football. Another great culture is the Afro-Asian culture, and it covers the area of South Asia and Southwest Asia or Middle East and North Africa and also East Africa. This culture started off in the area of Middle East and its classical languages are Arabic and Farsi and also Turkish in some part. Some international words in this culture are salam, which means well-being, and it is commonly used as a greeting. Then other words are din, religion, suba, morning, hal, situation, taze, fresh. And most of these words are known in African languages like Swahili and Hausa, in Middle Eastern languages like Arabic, Persian or Farsi and Turkish, and in South Asian languages like Hindi and Telugu, Urdu, and also even in <coughs> languages of Malaysia and Indonesia. The next great culture is the South Asian culture. So it covers the area of South Asia, and that means the subcontinent of India and Indochina. The classical languages of this culture are Sanskrit and Tamil. And some international words in, coming from this culture are Guru, which means teacher, Yoga, which means join or joining, union, and it is known in the West, especially in the practice of yoga. Other words are kar, work, mukha, face, nagre, town or city. The East Asian culture covers geographically the area of East Asia, which is the home of many populous nations like China, Japan, Korea and Vietnam. But the influence of this culture is also felt in Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia and other countries. The classical language of this culture is Middle Chinese. It was spoken somewhere in the Middle Ages, so it is different from the Chinese that is spoken today. Some international words in this culture are Dao, which means the way or road and it is known in the name of a religion or philosophy, Taoism or Taoism. Another word, Lai, to come, Lung, dragon, these are known mainly in East Asia. Then philosophical words, Yim and Yang, which means the negative and positive principle, or the dark and bright principle. The limits and boundaries between these cultures are not hard. It is possible to cross them and they have been crossed many times in history and they are being crossed all the time today. So there are already some, not very many, but some cross-cultural words and even global words. And I have listed some of them in this slide. For example, the word for bus is known almost everywhere in the world. The word ketchup, which comes from South China, has spread all across the world. The word mitre, which means meter, and it comes from Greek. 
is known in every, almost every language in the world. The Chinese word Taifang in the form Tufan or Tafun or Typhoon has spread all across the world. Finally, the Middle Eastern, possibly, possibly Aramaic or Hebrew word Shatan, which means devil, is known in almost all languages of the world that talk about religion. The reason why Pandunia takes words from different cultures is that it wants to join languages together. Pandunia wants to act as a bridge between different cultures. In this picture, there are three circles. Each circle symbolizes a language, and the area of the circle symbolizes its word stock. The first language in blue belongs to one culture, and the third language in green belongs to another culture. And Pandunia, which is in yellow, is like a glue that brings these languages together. For example, the first language could belong to a Euro-American culture, and it would be spoken in Europe or America, and the third language would belong to the Afro-Asian culture, and it would be spoken somewhere in Africa or Asia. Now, we know that these words have already some words in common, even without Pandunia. So that's why the blue and the green circle are already a little bit covering the same area. So I already mentioned, for example, the word autobus or bus, which is probably found in both of these languages. But there are not that many of those words that have crossed, crossed the boundaries between cultures naturally. And that's why we need Pandunia. Probably the Euro-American language has more words in common with Pandunia than it has with the Afro-Asian language. And vice versa. Probably the Afro-Asian language has more words in common with Pandunia than it has with the Euro-American language. So that's why the Pandunia circle covers more area on the other circles. Let's take a concrete example. Consider Spanish and Farsi. They have some words in common, mainly modern words of science and technology, but on the whole they are strangers to each other. However, if a Spanish speaker learns first Pandunia, they will learn at the same time a lot of Afro-Asian words from Farsi as well. So then learning Farsi for them would be relatively easy. Or if some, someone who speaks Farsi as their first language would learn Pandunia, then they would learn a lot of more Euro-American words in Pandunia, and therefore learning Spanish for them would be easier later. Now let's consider another example. Think about Spanish and Chinese. How much do they have in common with each other? I think not very much. The Spanish speakers and Chinese speakers haven't been in direct contact with each other most of the time in history. And therefore, these languages haven't been in direct contact. However, in today's world, both of these languages are very important. As you might know, Chinese is the most spoken first language in the world, and Spanish is the second most spoken first language in the world. Also, China is today the second greatest economy in the world. And of course, Chinese-speaking people and Spanish-speaking people are making a lot of trade with each other. They are doing business. So they have need to communicate. However, it is not easy for a Spanish speaker to learn Chinese, or vice versa, it's not easy for a Chinese speaker to learn Spanish. So Pandunia could serve as a bridge between these two languages. Now Spanish and Farsi and Spanish and Chinese are only two combinations of languages. There are hundreds of different combinations of languages. Think about your own situation. You speak your native language, 
and you could possibly learn 10 other languages or maybe 100 other languages a thousand other languages who knows but one thing is for sure most of those languages belong to different culture than your own therefore a bridge between cultures would be very useful in my opinion a world, the world really needs a language like this imagine if Pan Pandunia would be the universal second language that everybody learns in school. You know, it would prepare children to learn every other language in the world, unlike any other. There is no other language like this. All other languages are bridges to one direction only. They are like one-way streets. Think about it. If you learn English, you only learn the English culture. You don't learn anything about East Asian culture or Afro-Asian culture. Or think about even other constructed languages like Esperanto, Ido, Occidental, Interlingua, Lingua Franca Nova, and so on. They prepare people to learn Euro-American languages only. What if you are interested about other cultures? What do they do for you? They wouldn't help you at all. Now let's move to Pandunia grammar. The art of saying things in a simple manner. As I said before, Pandunia grammar is designed to be minimal. So it is very simple. It has very few rules and not many rules and like in most natural languages like like English or Russian or Arabic or Spanish. Pandunia is also regular. It always uses one and the same word form, always one and the same word order. So there are very few chances to make mistakes. Also, in Pandunia, people speak in plain language. Social structures are not encoded to the grammar of Pandunia. And there are no special rules for different social situations. Just say, just say what you mean and you get along just fine. Now I will show you just a few examples in spoken Pandunia. And there might be some words that you already saw before in this presentation. So. The word for greeting is salam or sal in short. It means hello. You can also say hello if you like. And then different greetings in the different times of day. Salam suba, good morning. Salam den, good day. Salam noche, good night. Salam lai, welcome. Salam chute, goodbye. Or in short, sal suba, sal den, sal noche. Salai, salchute. The word salam is not only for greetings, it can be also used as word. So you can say, mi salam tu, I greet you. Tu salam mi, you greet me. Mi salam da, I greet him. Da salam mi, he greets me. And as you can see, none of these words changes. All of them stay the same all the time. You only change the order of the words, but you don't change the words themselves. Finally, a longer example. Ching salam tu suma de mi. Please tell your greetings to your mother from me. I could tell you so much more about the grammar of Pandunia, but this is just a short presentation, so let's move forward. Uh, so, how does Pandunia compare to other languages? And I'm going to compare Pandunia to English and Esperanto. So, let's compare Pandunia to English. So, in this slide, things about Pandunia are on the left. And things about English are on the right. So Pandunia has global words that come from many different cultures, whereas English has, English has mostly European words that come from the Euro-American culture. Mm. So even though English is supposed to be a global language or the world language today, as many people say, in its heart, it is just a European language. And Pantunia is written in a simple way. One letter means one sound. English language, on the other hand, is not written like that. English language has 44 different sounds, but there are only 26 letters in the English alphabet. So to overcome this discrepancy, English language uses many different letter combinations to write those 44 different sounds. 
and unfortunately it use this, uses them in irregular way. So for example, the U sound can be written in four or five different ways as in this example sentence. U2 move to the Q2. Well, I'm not even sure did I pronounce it correctly. English is like that. You know, you learn it, you try to speak the best you can, but you never know <laughs> can you really speak it that well. Well, one thing for sure, I don't sound like a native speaker. English is also difficult to pronounce because it has quite a lot of consonants. The heavy and hard sounds compared to the to the vowel sounds which are soft and flowing. So here's an example of their greatest strengths. And I think that has a maybe <laughs> five five different consonants in a row. Okay, in English words also change. I carry him versus he carries me. So the pronouns I, me, and he, him, they have two different forms. And also the word carry, carries, changes a little bit, at least in the spelling. And also there is that final S sound. And English is a very irregular language. It is a natural language. It has developed. And many things in the in English language are just accidents of history that have accumulated. Nobody planned to make English difficult or simple, regular or irregular. It just has become like what it is today. And it is quite irregular language. And on the other hand, Eng uh, Pandunia is a designed, constructed language. So it is 100% regular. Okay, so let's compare Pandunia and Esperanto next. Again, Pandunia is on the left and Esperanto is on the right. Now this comparison is a little bit more equal because Esperanto is also a constructed language. Somebody made it. Actually, it was uh, an eye doctor living in today's area of Poland. And that day it was part of the empire of Russia. So Dr. Ludwig Zamenhof. And he lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And that was the time of colonialism and imperialism. So somebody who lived in Europe, and Europe was the leader of the world in that day, he didn't have to think about the rest of the world. And certainly Zamenhof didn't think about Asian language, Asian languages or African languages at all. He took all the words from European languages. So it is really hard that how can you present a language like Esperanto and say that it is a neutral language in the world today? It's not neutral. It's Euro-American. Now Esperanto also has quite many sounds, but it doesn't use different letter combinations. Instead, it has introduced special letters. So those are these letters with the hats, like che, or I think cho, jo, ho, jo, sho, wo. Okay. Esperanto is also pretty difficult to pronounce because it has a lot of combinations, difficult sound combinations. And I'm giving you just one example. This is not even the worst in Esperanto. So this is something that you could say or hear in practice. Mi venos post kvar noktoin. Okay, is this difficult to you? Well, it depends what languages do you speak already. But I can tell you for sure that this is pretty hard for someone who speaks Finnish like me, or maybe someone who is from Japan or Italy, China, or from uh, Tanzania or something. These sound combinations are hard. In comparison, the same sentence in Pandunia. Milaipos nelu noche. That has a nice combination, like nice variation. First, there is a hard sound and then a soft sound, hard sound, soft sound. So consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. It flows pretty easily. In Pandunia, words don't change at all, like I said before. But in Esperanto, words change, especially at the end of the words. Pandunia and Esperanto have a different grammatical structure. Esperanto has an agglutinative structure, and it means that endings are glued to word stems. So in this example sentence, mi volas vidi viain belain okuloin in Esperanto, 
we can look at, for example, the word Berlin, which means beautiful in the plural and accusative. So Bel is the root or stem that means beautiful. And the glued part A means that it is an adjective. Y means that it is a plural and N means that it is accusative. So altogether these four parts form one word, in one spoken word, Berlin. So in this sentence, Mivolas vidi viain, belain okuloin, there are altogether 17 parts. Whereas in the same Pandunia sentence, mi jau vide tusu mei oke, there are only seven parts. Mi, I, jau, want, vide, si, tu, you, su, possessive marker, mei, beautiful, oke, eyes. So I want to see your beautiful eyes. Pandunia has isolating structure, which means that the words don't change at all, and the words uh, or the mean uh, all the parts are separated from each other, and all the parts, all the meaningful parts of the sentence, are separate parts or isolated words. Let's move to the final section of this presentation. So I want to tell you a little bit about who speak Pandunia, and about the little international community that there is. Now, in early 2003, the speakers of Pandunia are counted in hundreds, not in thousands, not in ten thousands, not in millions, but only in hundreds. So there aren't really many of us yet. However, we are already an international community. Like there are people from Brazil, Britain, Chile, China, Colombia, France, Iran, Mexico, Netherlands, Russia, Thailand, the USA, and so on. So even though there aren't many of us, you can already get in contact with many, many parts of the world if you speak Pandunia. Now, <clears throat> the Pandunia community mostly works in internet. Not so much in real, in the physical life yet. So I have listed some groups where we communicate. For example, in Facebook, in Reddit, in Telegram, and also there is a Discord server for speaking in Pandunia. And everybody is free to join them. So what do we do in Pandunia? Well, we talk about life. We talk about things that matter to us. We use Pandunia and chat, but we also write texts about the things that we like, and we can publish them, for example, in a wiki, and we can share them in, in those aforementioned forums like Reddit or Facebook or Telegram, and let others to see what we have done. Then we translate stories from other languages, we make poems, and there are even some songs and videos in Pandunia. Hey, I admit it doesn't sound like much. But as we say, Pandaishe Laide Dane, everything big comes from a seed. So you gotta give it a chance to grow. Maybe one day Pandunia will be a big language, and it will really be the universal second language of the world. It really depends on you. So would you learn? Pandunia? Why would you learn Pandunia? Well, first of all, you can get friends in other countries, already now. Also, learning Pandunia will prepare you to learn new languages. And most importantly, you can be something important in the small Pandunia community. The Pandunia community is still so small that every new member can make a big difference if they want to. Also, Pandunia is a new kind of language. There hasn't been this kind of cross-cultural language before Pandunia. Pandunia fosters understanding between cultures, and therefore I think it can make the world a better and more peaceful place. So if you want to be part of that, join us. So, we have reached the end of this presentation. Thanks for watching, I hope you liked it. Shukrep!
Michu Kretumen. If you want to know more about Pandunia, I will add some links next to this video and you can follow them and go see what's happening in the world of Pandunia now. Bye bye. Salam chute.